Hi everyone. Good day to you, wherever you are. And I welcome you to the finest music drama channel. Sharing the love, of finest literature. Just, lie down on an easy chair. Throw your cares off your mind. Think of nothing, but the temperature of your drink. I hope, you will enjoy today's dramatization. Your comments are much appreciated. Please support the love, of finest literature, by subscribing and sharing the channel with friends, to get updated on future releases. For Maigret though, being at sea is only the prelude to making landfall in just the right place, something that happens only when he fully understands the people involved. In one of these novels, Simonon writes this about that mysterious process. By the time all the characters had taken on the same human roundness, when he could feel them, the mystery would be very close to being solved. You see, my dear lieutenant, I understand your disappointment perfectly. You have been told in error that I am an intelligent man who, in the course of his career, has solved a certain number of criminal problems. My friend O'Brien, who is fond of irony, must have exaggerated a little. Now, in the first place, I am not intelligent. It was funny to see the lieutenant as vexed as if someone were making fun of him, when Maigret had never been more sincere. In the second place, I try never to form an idea about a case before it's closed. Are you married? Of course replied Lewis, disconcerted by such a bizarre question. Uh, for years now, no doubt. And I'm sure you're convinced that your wife does not always understand you. And your wife, for her part, has the same conviction about you. Yet, you live together, you spend evenings together, you sleep in the same bed, you have children. Two weeks ago, I had never heard of Jean Mora or little John. Four days ago, I did not even know that Joss McGill existed. And it was only yesterday, in the home of a helpless old gentleman, that a medium spoke to me about a certain Jesse. Uh, and you'd like me to have a definite idea about each of them? I am at sea, Lieutenant. For Maigret, though, being at sea is only the prelude to making landfall in just the right place, something that happens only when he fully understands the people involved. In one of these novels, Simonon writes this about that mysterious process. By the time all the characters had taken on the same human roundness, when he could feel them, the mystery would be very close to being solved. Maigret sets a trap. I left word to see me first thing this morning, Chief Inspector Maigret. I came as soon as possible, Monsieur le Juge d'Instruction. Is all this true, these headlines and picture in every morning paper? I haven't seen the papers yet. You have made an arrest. Not that I know of. In this paper, it says in bold headlines, Killer caught at last. In this one, commotion at the Quai des Orfèvres is at the Montmartre maniac. I would like to point out, Chief Inspector, that when an event as important... Sir Commandeur, there has been no event... What about these headlines? Are you going to tell me the journalists have made it up? They have been making assumptions. In other words, nothing whatsoever took place. And these journalists just imagined that you had an unknown man brought to your office, questioned him for more than six hours, and then sent him to the no, cells. I didn't and... question anybody, Monsieur Le Juge. You'd better explain, so that I may be able to explain in turn to the public prosecutor whose first idea this morning was to call me at home. Someone came to see me yesterday afternoon, accompanied by two inspectors. Some of these inspectors had arrested? It was more in the nature of a friendly visit. Look here, May Gray, look at this photograph, spread across two columns on the front page of various newspapers. Is that why the man hides his face with his hat, a friendly visit? 
Who is this man? A delightful fellow called Mazet, Pierre Mazet, who worked under me for a time about ten years ago. In hopes of a more rapid promotion, he transferred to Central Africa, where he stayed for five years and uh, contracted some fever. And it was in order to receive him that you put the place into fighting trim, as the newspapers don't hesitate to yes, call it. Yes, Monsieur Comignon. I needed a man whose description would be as unimpressive as possible and whose face isn't known to the public or the press, you understand? Not very well. I made no announcement to the reporters. I kept saying I had nothing to say, that the visit hadn't any connection with the Montmartre crime. And the result is the screaming headline. The result I hoped for. What are you hoping Monsieur for? Monsieur le juge d'instruction, I set a trap. You better explain. <clears throat> I have known... Two or three cases of criminals writing to newspapers to protest because innocent people have been arrested. People like that often write, driven by wounded vanity or exhibitionism. Even a letter composed of words cut out of a newspaper might be a starting point. Of course, the killer could come up with another solution. Yes, an extremely simple solution. Immediately after the arrest, the killer might commit another murder similar to the previous ones. Perhaps two or three. I'm aware of my responsibility. And that's why I didn't inform you of my stratagem. How do you propose to spring the trap? Well, all Paris is on holiday. Don't I know. Even some of the bookseller boxes along the riverside are shut and padlocked. I'd never have believed I'd see the day when I'd stay in Paris in the middle of a heat wave. Under the direction of Inspector Lognon from the 18th arrondissement, in whose sector the murders took place, some of our men with their families have moved into the front rooms of the hotels of the Grand Carrière district, and they will cover every nook and cranny under the cover of being tourists. As many police women as possible will be circulating the streets. I'll be there myself tonight patrolling the streets with my driver. The driver will patrol the district in a random search pattern. Yes, Patron. What I didn't tell Comelio is that the murderer strikes so cleverly that he's away within two minutes, even in daylight. The first, on February the 2nd, Avenue Rachel, Arlette de Tour, age 26, prostitute, just off the brightly lit boulevard Clichy, stabbed twice in the back and her clothes slashed. March 3rd, Rue Les Piques, a little above the Moulin de Galles. Quarter past eight, Josephine Simé, midwife, 43 years old, a single stab wound in the back. Clothes slashed. April 17th through a text running beside the Montmartre Cemetery. Three minutes past nine again at night. Monique Juteau, age 24, stabbed three times in the back. Clothes slashed, nothing stolen. June 15th between 20 past and half past nine. Rue Durantin, still the same sector. Marie Bernard, 52, post office clerk, stabbed twice. Clothes slashed, nothing stolen. July 21st, the most recent, Georgette Lecoin, age 31. She didn't live far from the scene of the second murder. Stabbed once, clothes slashed. It is horrible and monotonous. Lognon and his colleagues have postponed their holidays, too. And there's no connection between the victims, none whatsoever, except that they were all on the stout side, that their clothes were slashed and that they weren't sexually molested. Hmm. There's a couple kissing. Everything's normal. What time is it? Uh, five past nine. Did I do the right thing? Last cliche. It'll stop. Listen. You hear that? I heard nothing. Now listen, listen. Police whistles. Yes. Where are they? It's hard to tell at night. Down there. A car from the 18th arrondissement. There, towards the Place Terre. Follow him. Move on, move on. There's nothing to be seen. Move on. Oh, it's uh, you, Patron. What happened? I don't know exactly. The man got away. They're chasing him. Is someone hurt? She's not hurt. Who? Martha Jusseron, one of the police women. Oh. Bring uh, Martha Jusseron over here. Oh, Chief Inspector Maigret, I still can't think how he slipped through my fingers. But I have one of his jacket buttons with some fabric from his jacket. Where did he attack you? Well, as I was going past that alley. 
Well, he let me go past, and at the very last second, I sensed some movement behind me. A hand grabbed my throat, and then I managed a judo hold. Mm. Get into my car, mademoiselle. You're Marthe Jusserin. Uh, yes. And how old are you? Uh, 22? 25. Patron, we're in the way. Can I move the car? No, back to the key. Can you uh, describe him? Well, not really. But it went so quickly and he came from behind. On the other hand, I swear his eyes were blue or gray. He was wearing a dark suit. He had light hair and looked fairly young. Would you recognize him again? Yes. Yes, I think so. You don't remember any other detail? No. Did he wear a tie? Oh, I think so. He had a ring on his finger. No? Wedding ring or signet ring? Well, now, wait a minute. Uh, first of all, I, I, I felt it between my fingers, and then when I put the judo hold on him, his hand came close to my face. A, a signet ring would have been thicker. There had been a flat place on it. Hmm. No, it was certainly a wedding ring. You did very well. The laboratory will surely be able to identify the weave, and that's an expensive button, you know. And tomorrow we'll have everybody available to interview suppliers. Don't worry, we'll be able to find out who wove the cloth, what tailors purchased it, and... Which of them made that suit? You did very well. Chief Inspector Magrain. Yes, Lapointe. Eh? The owner of the suit? You found him? Name and address. Eh? Marcel Montsaint. Boulevard Saint Germain. Number 228B. Where are you speaking from? Boulevard Saint-Germain. Well, what's the name of the bistro? Café Solferino. Stay there without showing yourself, and I'll be there in a quarter of an hour. You, uh, have a sample of the material? Good. It was so easy that I'm afraid to believe it, Patron. What are you drinking? Uh, Blanc Vichy. I'll have a draft beer. Are you alone? The two inspectors are on the top floor of the house. Others on the pavement outside, more across the boulevard and at the corner of the street. Not to mention two radio cars close by. It's no doubt superfluous. Killers of this type seldom defend themselves. At any rate, with weapons. Do I come with you? Yes, come along. Where does he live? The second floor on the left. The house is quiet and comfortable, and its old-fashioned style dating back from the middle of the 19th century has something reassuring about it. Shall we take the elevator? Let's walk up. Most of the mats outside the doors, which are of dark wood, bear one or more initials in red, and all the doorbells are well polished. No sound from the apartments, no smell of cooking drifts out to the stairs. Yes, here's the brass plate of a lung specialist. Ah, here we are. Marcel Moussin, architect decorator. This is your husband here, Madame Moussin? That's to say... That means he is. Hmm? Yes, but he's asleep. Oh, I must ask you to wake him. May I ask who... Criminal police. You are Chief Inspector Maigret, aren't you? I thought I recognized you. Uh, come in. Please wake your husband. I suppose he got home late last night, eh? What do you mean? What, does he usually sleep in the morning until after 11? Often. He, he likes to work in the evening, sometimes late into the night. He's an intellectual, an artist. He didn't go out last night? Not that I know of. Well, if you'll wait in the drawing room, I'll go and tell him. The glass panel door leads into the drawing room, furnished in a modern style which is unexpected in this old house. But again, it has nothing aggressive about it. I wouldn't mind living in a setting like this. Only the paintings on the wall. I can't make head or tail of them. He'll be here in a moment. <laughs> Marcel is curiously shy in one way. I sometimes tease him about it. He hates to be seen when he's just out of bed. You have separate rooms? So do a lot of married couples, don't they? In their circle, it's more the rule than the exception, I imagine. It means nothing. What I'm trying to decide is whether she's playing a part. Whether she knows something or whether she's really wondering what connection there could be between me and her husband. Your husband uh, works here? Yes, in here, in his office. A spacious office with two windows overlooking the Boulevard Saint-Germain. A drafting table, rolls of paper, 
Some curious models made of plywood or wire which resemble stage scenery. He works a lot? Too much for his health. He's never been strong. We should have been in the mountains now. We always go at this time of year, but he accepted a commission which will prevent us from taking a holiday at all. I've rarely seen a woman so composed with such self-control. Surely she ought to be panic-stricken at seeing me arrive like this, considering that the papers are full of the killer and everyone knows that I'm in charge of the investigation. But she's simply watching me, as though interested to see a famous man at close quarters. I'll go and see if he's nearly ready. Uh, let's sit down, the point. Light my pipe. It's not she who comes in, but a man who looks so young that one is tempted to think there must be some mistake. He's wearing pajamas and a light shade of beige, which emphasizes his fair hair, delicate skin, and bright blue eyes. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, gentlemen. My wife woke me up just now to tell me you were here. A smile which has something fragile and childish about it. Has his wife no curiosity about the purpose of my visit? She doesn't seem to be coming back. Perhaps she's listening at the door, her husband closed behind him. I've been working very hard just lately on the interior decoration of a huge house one of my friends is building on the Normandy coast. Oh, it's even hotter than yesterday, isn't it? It's no use opening the windows. I hope we shall have a storm. I must apologize for being obliged to ask you some personal questions. To begin with, I would like to see the suit you wore yesterday. Excuse me a moment. Mm. You were wearing this yesterday? May I have it? At that point, uh, what was the tailor's name? Uh, Svoboda, Ruveno. That is your tailor? Yes. You wore this suit last evening? Until just after dinner, and then I changed into what I'm wearing now before starting work. You didn't go out after 8 o'clock? No, I, uh, I stayed in my office until about 2 o'clock or half past 2, which explains why I was still asleep when you arrived. Really? From close up, however, his face has a worn look which contrasts with his youthful appearance. His complexion has something sickly or faded about it, which is not unattractive, as sometimes happens with women who are just past their first youth. Might I ask you to show me your whole wardrobe, please? If you wish. Uh, come, this way. He stiffens slightly, as though on the point of protesting or refusing. The bedroom is decorated in light brown, with an unmade day bed in the middle. Let me open the curtain. The closet fills the whole of one wall. Those are sliding doors. <sighs> Six suits hanging on the right-hand end, all of them immaculately pressed as though they are fresh from the cleaners. Three overcoats, one lightweight one, dinner jacket, tailcoat. None of the suits of the same material as the sample that point has in his pocket. Now give me the sample, the point. Yes. Last autumn, uh, Monsieur Monsin, your tailor made you a suit in this material. You remember it? I remember. What has become of it? I know. Uh, someone standing on the bus platform burned the lapel with a cigarette. Well, and you took it to be mended? Oh, no, no. I hate anything, no matter what, which has been damaged. Well, it's an idiosyncrasy, but I've always been like that. Even when I was a child, I'd throw away a toy that had a scratch on it. You threw the suit away? You mean you put it in the garbage, an almost new suit? Because of a cigarette burn? No, I uh, gave it away. Yourself? Yes, I uh, took it with me one evening when I was going for a walk by the Seine, as I sometimes do, and gave it to a clochard. Was this long ago? Two or three days. Be precise, please. Uh, the evening before last. In the other section of the closet are at least a dozen pairs of shoes lined up on shelves, while in the middle are drawers full of shirts, shorts, pajamas, handkerchiefs, all in perfect order. Where are the shoes you were wearing yesterday evening? I wasn't wearing shoes. I was wearing the slippers I have on now since I was in my office. Hmm. Mr. Moussa, I must ask you to get dressed and come with me to the Quai des Orfèvres. May I inquire for what reason? Not now. Later, in my office. Not the right one this time. Sit down, Mr. Morsin. If you're too hot, you can take your jacket off. Thank you. I always keep it on. 
Uh, one moment, please. Thomas? Patron. Round up four men resembling Montsaint in age, height, and general appearance, and send for uh, Marthe Gisana. For the clerks from the prefecture, do? Yes. Right. Have you uh, been married long, Monsieur Monsaint? Twelve years. May I ask your age? I'm 32. I got married when I was 20. You're an architect? Yeah, architect decorator. That means, I suppose, that you're an architect who specializes in interior decoration. Well, not, not exactly. You don't mind explaining to me? Uh, I'm not allowed to draw up plans for a building because I haven't actually got a degree in architecture. What degree have you? I began as a painter. At what age? 17. You finished high school? Uh, no. Ever since I was a child, I wanted to be an artist. The pictures you saw in our drawing room are by me. In short, you're not a qualified architect, and uh, if I understand you correctly, anybody can call himself a decorator. <laughs> I appreciate your amiable way of making things clearer. I suppose you're trying to imply that I am a failure, and you're entitled to do so. I've heard it before. You were born in Paris? Yes. Whereabouts? At the corner of the Rue Colancourt and the Rue de Mestre. In other words, in the very middle of the 18th arrondissement where the five murders and the unsuccessful attempt took place. Did you live there long? Until I got married. Are your parents still alive? Only my mother. Who lives? Still in the same house, the one I was born in. You're on good terms with her? My mother and I have always got along well. What was your father's occupation, Monsieur Monsin? He was a butcher. In Montmartre? At the address I gave you. He died... Uh... When I was 14. Your mother sold the business? Well, she hired a manager for a while and then sold the store, but kept the house where she has an apartment on the fourth floor. Come in. <coughs> They're here. And Marthe Gisselin also? No, uh, oh, no, yes, here she comes. In here, mademoiselle. Uh, stand beside me, my dear. You gentlemen line up against the wall... And you too, Monsieur Monsin. <coughs> Take your time, mademoiselle. That's him, isn't it? Well, you ought to know. You're the only person who saw him. Well, I have the impression it is he. I feel convinced it is, and yet... And yet? I'd like to see him in profile. Uh, turn sideways, Monsieur Monsin. I'm practically sure. He wasn't wearing the same clothes, and... His eyes didn't have the same expression, but... This evening, mademoiselle, we shall take both of you to the spot where you saw your assailant with the same lighting and perhaps with him in the same clothes because at this very moment my men are searching along the banks of the Seine and the Place Maubert, searching all clochard hangouts in Paris, and they will find the suit with the missing button. You don't need me any longer? No, thank you. As for you, Monsieur Moussin, you can sit down again. And the rest of you, thank you. <coughs> Cigarette? Thank you, no, I don't smoke. The point, step over here. Patron? Stay with him. But don't ask him any questions or speak to him at all. And if he asks me anything? Be evasive. Good luck. Oh, Lonio. Uh, I'm here to ask for instructions. Would you put your head into my office and take a look at the fellow with the point? Hmm? Do you know him? I'm sure I've seen him before. But where? In what circumstances? His father was a butcher in the Rue Colancourt. He's dead, but the mother is still living in the same house. So come with me. We're going to visit her. The house is clean, well kept. What's the cut or two below the one in the Boulevard Saint-Germain? The elevator shaft is narrower. So are the doors and the landings. The stairs are polished or varnished without carpet. And in most cases, there are visiting cards on the doors instead of brass plates. The woman is much younger than I expected, very thin, and so nervous that her face keeps twitching. What do you want? Chief Inspector Megray of the criminal police. Oh, you're sure it's me you want to speak to? Come in. I was just doing the housework. She's as dark as her son is fair, with small, bright eyes and a few gray hairs on her upper lip. The apartment's perfectly tidy. Rooms are small. 
Furniture dates from the time of her marriage. You saw your son yesterday evening? What have the police got to do with my son? Please be good enough to answer my question. Why should I have seen him? I imagine he comes to see you now and then. Often. With his wife? I don't see what that has to do with you. She does not ask us to sit down and remain standing herself. On the walls are photographs of Marcel Monsin at all ages, some of them taken in the country, and drawings and childish paintings, which he must have done when he was small. Did your son come here yesterday evening? Who told you so? He did come? No. Nor during the night? He is not in the habit of coming to see me at night. Are you or are you not going to explain the meaning of these questions? I warn you, I shan't answer any of them. I'm in my own home and I can keep silent if I choose. Madame Moussin, I regret to inform you that your son is suspected of having committed five murders in the last few months. What did you say? We have good reason to believe he's the man who's been attacking women on street corners in Montmartre and who missed his attempt last night. You dare to accuse my Marcel? But if I tell you it's not true, that he's innocent, as innocent as... as... I have the impression that she's acting. Her reaction is not the natural reaction of a mother who was not expecting anything of this kind. She stares at the photographs of her son when he was a child. Look at him. Take a good look at him, and you won't dare to say such abominable things again. Your son has not been here within the last 48 hours? No. No, no. Well, when did you last see him? I don't know. You don't remember his visits? No. Tell me, Madame Moussin, did he have any serious illness as a child? Nothing more serious than measles and an attack of bronchitis. What are you trying to get me to admit? That he's mad? That he's always been mad? When he got married, it was with your approval? Yes, I was fool enough. It was even I who... It was you who arranged the marriage? What does it matter now? And now you are no longer on good terms with your daughter-in-law? What's that got to do with you? That concerns my son's private life, which is nobody else's business, do you hear? Neither mine nor yours. If that woman... If that woman... Nothing. You've arrested Marcel. He's in my office at the Quai des Enfants. Handcuffed? No. You're going to put him in jail? Possibly. In fact, probably. The girl he attacked last night has identified him. Well, she's lying. Now, I want to see him. I want to see her, too, and tell her... It's the fourth or fifth sentence she's cut short like that. Her eyes are dry, but glittering with fever or rage. Oh, wait a minute. I'm coming with you. If you feel awkward about having me with you, I'll take the metro. I warn you, this inspector's going to stay here and search your apartment. He is? Yes, madame. If you want things to be done according to regulations, I'm prepared to provide a search warrant. Come along. As for you, I have a feeling I've seen you before. And if you are unlucky enough to break anything or mess up my cupboard... Ah, no. It's not going to be like that. I'll go as high up as I have to. I'll see the minister. I'll see the president of the republic if necessary. As for the newspapers, they'll just have to print what I tell them. This way, madame. Uh. Oh, oh, don't be frightened, Marcel. I'm here. Mama. What are they doing to you? Oh, at least they haven't beaten you up. No, eh? no, mama. They're mad. I tell you, they're mad. But I'm going to find the best lawyer in Paris, Marcel. I don't care how much he charges. I'll spend my last cent if necessary. Oh. I'll sell the house. I'll go and beg in the streets. Hush, Mama. Hush, hush. Yvonne knows you're here? She knows, Mama. What did she say? If you will sit down, Madame. I don't need to sit down. What I want is to have my son back. Come along, Marcel. We'll soon see if they dare to keep you. I'm sorry to have to tell you that we dare. So... You're arresting him. At any rate, he's a material witness. Yes, it's the same thing. Have you thought it over properly? Do you realize your responsibilities? I warn you, I won't be pushed around. I'm going to move heaven and earth. Be good enough to sit down and answer a few questions. I'm answering nothing whatsoever. 
Don't be afraid, Marcel. Don't let them intimidate you. Mother's here. I'm taking care of you. You'll soon be hearing from me. Your mother seems to be very fond of you. I'm all she has left. She was very much attached to your father? What kind of man was your father? Your mother was not happy with him? He was a butcher. You were ashamed of that? But I beg you not to ask me such questions, Chief Inspector. I know perfectly well what you're getting at, and I tell you, you are mistaken all along the line. When you see what a state you've got my mother into... Well, she got herself into it. I suppose that somewhere or other, your men are now putting my wife through the same treatment. And there's nothing she can tell you, any more than my mother, any more than I can myself. Now, question me as much as you like, but... Leave the women in peace. Now, sit down. Again. Will it be long? Probably. I suppose I'll get nothing to eat or drink. Well, what would you like? Some water. You wouldn't rather have beer? I don't drink beer or wine or spirits. And you don't smoke. Le point. come over here. Yes, Petro. Begin questioning him, little by little, without pushing. Talk to him again about that suit and ask him what he was doing on... February the 2nd, March the 3rd, uh, yes. all the dates where the murders were committed in Montmartre. I'm going to lunch at the Brasserie Dauphin. I'm tired and depressed. I don't know why. He's a man unlike others. A man who kills without any reason other people can understand in an almost childish way. Afterwards, tearing his victim's clothing as though by whim. Does he realize he's lost? Has he realized this morning when his wife woke him and told him the police were waiting for him in the drawing room? What are the reactions of a man like that? Is he unhappy? In between his crimes, does he feel shame or hatred of himself and his instincts? Or does it give him a kind of satisfaction to feel that he is different from other people? Different in a way he might think of as superior? Uh, I'd better go back to the office. What did I eat? I had stewed veal because it smelled good like home cooking. We found Marcel Monsin's jacket. Yeah, that clochard with his cap in his hand? Yes. Where did you find him? Down by the river near the Pont d'Orcellet. What does he say? That he found the jacket on the riverbank. Oh, when? morning at six o'clock. And the uh, trousers? Oh, they were there too. He was with a pal. They divided the suit between them. We've not laid hands on the one with the trousers yet. Well, take the jacket and give it to Murs in the laboratory. I don't know whether it's possible, but it seems to me they should be able to discover if a burn in cloth is recent or old. And tell him that in this case it's a question of 48 hours. You understand? I understand, Patron. Oh, you shouldn't have opened the window, La Pointe. Only lets in hot air. Can you see your notes? No fresh developments? Maitre Riviere phoned to say he is to be the defense lawyer. Mm. Wanted to come over right away. I asked him to speak to Juste d'Instruction Camelio. Uh, that's right. And then? Uh, Jean Vier called from the Boulevard Saint Germain. In Monsieur Monsin's office, he found erasing knives of all types, which might have been used for the different murders. He also found in the bedroom a switchblade knife, which has a blade only about three inches long. Do you remember what Dr. Paul had to say about the weapon? He had a lot to say, Patron. He said crimes of this nature are usually committed with a fairly large knife. Butcher knives or carving knives or a dagger or something. Like and he also said to judge by the shape and depth of the wounds, I'm tempted to think the criminal used an ordinary penknife. An ordinary penknife would have closed up, of course. This one must at least have a safety catch. In my opinion, the weapon is not dangerous in itself. What makes it fatal is the skill with which it is used. We have found your jacket, Monsieur Monsieur. Down by the river. Yes. Have you had enough to eat? Tired? He responds with a half-smile of resignation. Everything about him, including his clothes, is in half tones. He, he's retained from his boyhood something timid and charming, which is hard to define. 
Does it come from his fair hair, his complexion, his blue eyes, or from delicate health? I'll take your place, my point. Can I go? I'll wait in the other room. Uh, let me know if Mers finds anything. Are you uh, very unhappy? Why should I be unhappy? When did you discover that you are not like other people? Do you find I'm not like other people? When you were a young man. Well, what? Don't you know? I have a feeling that at one point, if I could... If I could have found exactly the right words, the barrier between me and the man sitting stiffly in his chair on the other side of my desk would have broken down. There was a quiver. I did not imagine that quiver when I asked him when he discovered that he wasn't like other people. For a few seconds, the tension was reduced, and very little would have been needed to bring tears to Monson's eyes. You uh, realize, do you not, that you are in no danger either of execution or of a prison sentence? I am in no danger of anything since I'm innocent. Innocent of what? What you are accusing me of. I have nothing more to say to you. I shall answer no more questions. Have I chosen the wrong tactics, the wrong words? He's drawn himself up again, recovered his self-control, his appearance of absolute calm. And I can feel he has made the decision and won't answer any more questions. As you like. The point. Anything from Merz? Yes, the burn in the jacket is not more than 12 hours old. All the same, he's going to make some experiments. If it's all right with you, he's going to burn the jacket in two other places as controls if the case comes to trial. Mm -hmm. Tell him to go ahead. And I'm going to Monson's apartment. Where's his wife, Janvier? No, oh, about a half hour ago, she asked me if she could go and lie down. How was she behaving until then? I didn't see much of her. Now and again, she'd come, put her head into whatever room I was in to see what I was up to. You didn't ask her any questions? You didn't tell me to. You found anything interesting? Well, I had a chat with the maid. She's only been here about six months. Mm. The Mossans entertain very little and don't go out often. They haven't got any close friends. From time to time, they go for the weekend to her parents, who it seems have a house out at Triel, where they live all year round. What sort of people? Mm, the father had a pharmacy at Place Vichy. He retired a few years ago. Now here's a box full of photographs, mostly of Madame Massin. Her business letters, not many. She seems to have only had about a dozen clients. And bills? What I can see, they don't pay them until they've had three or four reminders. Oh, Madame Massin, I didn't hear you come in. Haven't you brought him back? Not until he gives us satisfactory explanations of certain uh, coincidences. You really believe it was he? One day you'll see you were mistaken, and then you'll be sorry for the harm you're doing him. Do you love him? He's my husband. You've put him in prison? Not yet. He's at the Quai des Orfèvres. We're going to question him again. What does he say? He refuses to answer. You really have nothing to tell me, Madame Monson? Nothing. You realize that even if your husband is guilty, he will neither go to the guillotine nor to hard labor. I've told him that. A man who kills five women in the street and then slashes their clothes is a sick man. He may deceive people. He certainly does, but no one has found his behavior strange until now. Are you listening? I listen. Five women have died so far. And as long as the killer or the maniac or the madman, call him what you like, remains at large, other lives will be in danger. Do you realize that? And do you realize that although up to now he has attacked only women going along the street, perhaps tomorrow he may begin to attack the people around him? Aren't you afraid? No. You don't have the impression that for months, perhaps for years, you yourself have been in mortal danger? No. It is disheartening. You've seen my mother-in-law? What did she say? She protested. May I ask why the two of you are on bad terms? I don't care to talk about it. It's of no importance. You can come along now, jean -Vier. You're not going to send my husband back to me? No. We're going to have supper, and then we're going to meet the others and march to Jusserin at the corner of Rue Norvain for definite identification. There were no uh, lights, Mademoiselle Jusserin? No, it was just the same as this. Mm. Now, try to look at him from the angle at which you first saw him. 
You uh, recognize him? I'm certain. Do you formally identify him? Yes. No, I shan't need you anymore this evening, then. Thank you very much, mademoiselle. You heard that, Mr. Monsignor? I heard. You have nothing to say? Nothing. Take him back, you two. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night, my Gaston. I'm going home to bed. Who's speaking? Uh, Lorio here. I'm sorry to disturb you. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I, I'm listening. I, I can't talk too loud. My wife is asleep. Uh, I understand. Where are you? In the Rue de Mest. Uh, there's just been another murder. Mm. A woman stabbed several times. Her dress has been slashed. You sure? Hello, Lorio? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm still here. When? Uh, to begin with, what time is it? Uh, ten past twelve. When did it happen? Uh, about three quarters of an hour ago. I tried to get you at the key. I was all alone in my station. I'll be right there. <sighs> Megri here. Give me the inspector's room. Is that you, Thomas? You've already heard from Lunyon? I suppose our man hasn't budged. Huh? We just checked up on her. Oh, I'm dealing with it. Will you send me a car at once? Yes, to my home. I was on night duty when the news came through. I came here at once. Dead. At least six knife wounds. In the back, as usual? No, at least four in the chest. Another in the throat, which seems to have been delivered after the others, probably when the victim had already fallen to the ground. Mm. The coup de grace. Uh, there are other wounds, more superficial, on the forearms and hands. Do we know who she is? Janine Laurent, a maid working for Monsieur and Madame Durandon in the Rue de Clignancourt. Her age? Nineteen. The poor child is wearing what must have been her best dress. Made of sky blue material, almost a ball dress. She's been out dancing. Just give general description, no details, such as the color of the dress and so on. Who gave the alarm? A patrolman. Uh, he saw nothing. Uh, when he found the body, the wounds were still bleeding. Have her taken to the Forensic Institute and inform uh, Dr. Paul. Have you given any orders? I've sent all the men I could find to search the district. Well, my dear Chief Inspector, who told you? Someone on the street. There are still some people who think the press has its uses. Though it still wasn't the right man. You see to the rest of it, Lonio. Uh, you don't need anyone? No. There's nothing for me to do at the Quai des Enfers. What is it that hasn't been tried already? I have no heart to go back to bed. I must give myself time to calm down. Oh, it's not possible that I've been mistaken. Now I am angry. I made a mistake. I know that, and now I know what it was. It's too late to put things right when a little girl is dead. A country girl who, like thousands of others every year, came to try her luck in Paris and who went dancing after a day spent in the kitchen. It's too late to even get confirmation of the idea I have. By this time, I'd find nothing. <laughs> the men are as worn out as I am. This thing's been going on too long. In the morning, when they read their papers in the metro or on the bus on their way to the Quai des Orfèvres, they'll all feel the same stupefaction, the same despondency that I do. Many of them will begin to lose confidence in me. Lonio was embarrassed when he phoned. And in the Rue de Mestre, he almost seemed to be commiserating with me. I can imagine Comignot's reaction, his imperious phone call the moment he opens his newspaper. Well, I have nothing to do for the time being. I do not want to sleep. There'll be time for that once this thing is really over. To the key, driver. Nothing, uh, nothing fresh come in, Torrance? Always the same thing. They're questioning the passers-by. They've arrested two foreigners whose papers weren't in order. 
Here's a cup of coffee, patron. Uh, what time is it? Twenty past five. Are they here? Janvier is. As for La Pointe, he here should I be am, oh. Patron. They're <laughs> both freshly shaved. Those of us who've been up all night have bristly cheeks and muddy complexions. Uh, Janvier, you go to the Rue Coulancourt. Take uh, one of the others with you. Doesn't matter which, who's ever the whoever's the least tired. To the old woman's apartment? Yes, bring her here to me. She'll protest. She'll most likely refuse to come. Well, she's sure to. I'll give her this subpoena. You, Lapointe, go to the Boulevard Saint-Germain and get Madame Monsing. Are you giving me a subpoena, too? Yes, though in her case I doubt whether it's absolutely necessary. Then uh, put them both together in an office, lock them up safely, and come and tell me. Any more coffee, Torres? In a moment, Patron. I'm making more. Gognon didn't phone? Yes, about four o'clock. To say there were no fresh developments, except that the uh, little girl definitely had been to a dance hall somewhere near the Place du Théâtre. Mm. She went there once a week. She had no steady boyfriend. She left by herself? And the boys think so, though they're not sure. They have the impression she was a good girl. Oh, they're here? Yes. Did the sparks begin to fly? Well, after one glance, they pretended not to know each other. What do we do now? For the moment, nothing. You go and uh, sit in the next office near the communicating door. If they decide to talk, try to hear what they say. And if they don't? Have some newspapers taken in. One of them knows nothing of last night's crime. Have the papers put on the desk as though that's the usual thing, but make sure they can both see the headlines from where they're sitting. Right. <coughs> Cormelio hmm? has phoned twice. Uh, I'll tell him I'm somewhere in the building and they've gone to look for me. And tell someone to bring Monsin up from the cells. Yes, Petro. Well, the weather is bright again. Sunshine is dazzling. The heat is not as oppressive as in the past few days. There's a breeze stirring. You uh, have been informed of what happened last night, Monsieur Monsin? No one has told me a word. Now read that newspaper. Monsin's first reaction was annoyance. He frowned as though surprised and displeased. Is he feeling a kind of suppressed anger? As if something were being spoiled for him? As you see, someone is doing the utmost to save you. So much the worst if it costs the life of a poor girl who only just came to Paris. Did his lips twitch in a furtive smile? He tried to repress it, but all the same it betrayed a childish satisfaction quickly concealed. Your two women are here. They'll be brought in presently, and you can have it out among yourselves. You are still determined to keep silent? I have nothing to say. Aren't you beginning to feel it's time to finish with all this? Don't you think, Monsanto, that this makes at least one crime too many? If you had talked yesterday, this murder wouldn't have been committed. It has nothing to do with me. You know, don't you, which of them foolishly made up her mind to save you? He's no longer smiling. His face hardened again. He's angry with the woman who murdered. I'll tell you what I think of you. You are probably a sick man because I prefer to believe that no man whose brain is normal would do what you have done in any circumstances. You were just an ordinary child, at least in appearance, a butcher's son. Did you feel humiliated at being a butcher's son? Well, it humiliated your mother, too. She saw you as a kind of aristocrat who had strayed into the Rue Coulancourt. Weren't you annoyed to be fussed over and treated like a delicate creature in need of continual care? You might have rebelled, as so many boys do in such circumstances. You didn't rebel because you're lazy, and your vanity is without bounds. Some people are born with a title, with money, with servants, and a whole edifice of comfort and luxury around them. You were born to a mother who took the place of all that for you. Whatever might happen to you, your mother was there. You knew it. You could do whatever you wanted, only you had to pay for it. By submissiveness, you belonged to your mother. Was it she who married you off at the age of 20 for fear you'd begin to have love affairs? I don't think you were in love because you're too self-centered for that. You married Yvonne for the sake of peace and perhaps in the hope of escaping from your mother's influence. 
Your mother was taken in, she thought, if Arne was just a little goose with whom she could do as she pleased. The little goose turned out to be not only a real wife, but a female as possessive as your mother. And a battle began between the two of them, with you as the stake, while you, no doubt, were dragged in both directions. Your wife won the first round. She got you away from the Rue Colincourt and transplanted you to the Boulevard Saint-Germain. She gave you a new outlook, new surroundings, new friends. And from time to time, you slipped away and went back to Montmartre. Didn't you begin to feel rebellious towards Yvonne, just as you used to towards your mother? Both of them, Monsin, were preventing you from being a man. That's what you imagined, what you tried to believe, but at the bottom of your heart you knew quite well it wasn't true. You hadn't the courage to be a man. And that was precisely what humiliated you. How many times have you wanted to kill them? I don't mean the poor unknown girls you've been murdering in the street. I mean your mother and your wife. You tossed back and forth between the Rue Colincourt and the Boulevard Saint-Germain. You went around like a ghost. When? Why? Under the stress of what emotion? What humiliation worse than the others triggered off the whole thing? Hmm? I have no idea. Only you can answer that question. And I'm not even sure that you can. How could you assert yourself? Not in your profession, because you know you have always been a failure. Or what's worse, an amateur. So how are you to assert yourself? By what outstanding action? Did you have the idea of killing the two women? But that would be dangerous. The search would automatically turn in your direction and there would be no one left to back you up, and flatter you, encourage you. It was they, the domineering females, that you resented. It was females you turned against in the street, haphazard. <laughs> I suppose the first time, on February 2nd, it brought you relief, huh? a momentary intoxication. You'd taken your precautions, for you didn't wish to pay the price to go to the guillotine, to prison, or to some psychiatric asylum. You are a middle-class criminal, Monsieur Monsin, a mollycoddle of a criminal, a criminal who must have his comforts and his little attentions. Uh, you proved yourself to be clever. You chose a district where you knew every hole and corner, as only those brought up in a place can know it. You chose a weapon which was silent and which at the same time gave you a feeling of physical satisfaction as you used it. You had to have your furious, violent gesture... You needed to destroy and to feel that you were destroying. You tore your victim's dress and underclothes, and the psychiatrist will no doubt see something symbolic in that. You didn't rape your victims because you're not capable of that, because you've never been a real man. He suddenly raised his head and glared at me, clenching his teeth. He looks ready to tear my eyes out. If those dresses, slips, bras and panties were just so much... Womanliness that you were tearing to pieces. You know, Monsieur Morsin, I shall remember you all my life because never before in my career has a case bothered me so much. I'm taking so much out of me. When you were arrested yesterday, neither of those women thought you were innocent. And one of them decided to save you. They have been here since the early hours of this morning, face to face in an office, and neither of them has uttered a word. For years, they've been competing to prove which of them loved you the most, which of them possessed you most completely. Hello. Yes, me. Oh, yes, Monsieur Le Juge, he's here. I beg your pardon, but I need him for an hour longer. No, the papers were telling the truth. An hour. Mm, they're both here at the key. Bring me those two women. Come in, madame. Please sit down. I'm not trying to deceive you. Uh, shut the door, Lapointe. No, don't go away. Stay here and take notes. As I said, I'll not try to deceive you to make you think Monsin has confessed. Uh, 
I might have questioned you separately. What right have you to question Be any quiet, of us? Be quiet, Madame Monsin, not now. Whether he confesses or not, he has committed five murders, and you know it, both of you. For you know his weaknesses better than anyone. Sooner or later, it will be proved. Sooner or later, he will end up in prison or in an asylum. Yvonne Monsin is sitting quietly on the edge of her chair, like a young lady paying a call. One of you took it into her head that by committing another murder, she could avert suspicion from him. All that remains is for us to find out which of you last night murdered a certain Jeanine Laurent at the corner of the Rue de Mestre. You have no right to question us without a lawyer present. I forbid my son and daughter-in-law to speak, either of them. It's our right to have legal advice. Kindly sit down again, madame, unless you have a confession to make. Oh, that's the last straw. To suggest I should make a confession. You're behaving like... Like a boor, which is what you are, and you... I tell you once again to sit down. If you continue to make a scene, I shall have you taken away by an inspector who will question you while I deal with your son and daughter -in -law. Yes, well, I would like you to do that. Am I not his mother? Aren't my rights more long-standing, more self-evident than those of a snip my son just happened to have married? It wasn't Ivan who brought him into the world. It was Madame, me. this is my last warning. There is nothing. Nobody has any... That's better. Now, not only did one of you hope to save Monsin by committing a murder similar to his while he was locked up, but that one, I'm convinced, had known for a long time what was going on. So she had the courage to stay near him in the same room at times, with no protection, with no chance of escape, if he should suddenly have the idea of killing her, too. Now, I repeat what I told you before. Monsin will almost certainly save his head. The psychiatrist, as usual, will not agree about him. They will argue in front of a jury who will not understand what it's all about, and there's every chance that he'll get the benefit of the doubt, and in that case, he will be sent to spend the rest of his days in an asylum. For the woman, it isn't the same thing. For six months, Paris has been living in terror, and people never forgive those who have frightened them. The members of the jury will be the fathers or husbands of women who might have been stabbed to death by Monsin at some street corner. There will be no question of madness. In my opinion, it is the woman who will pay. She knows that. It is one or the other of you. One or the other of you to save a man, or more precisely, in order to preserve what she regards as her property, has risked her neck. I am perfectly willing to die for my son. He is my child. It does not matter to me what he has done. And it does not matter to me what becomes of little tarts who walk the streets of Montmartre at night. You killed Jeanine Laurent? I don't know her name. Uh, you're responsible for the murder committed in the Rue de Mestre last night? Yes. What was the color of the dress she was wearing? I... It was too dark to see Excuse her. me, you were aware that she was attacked less than five meters away from the street lamp? I didn't pay any attention. But when you slashed the material... Uh, the dress was blue. Yes. It was blue. And the crime was committed more than 50 meters from the nearest street lamp. Yvonne's smiling and turns to stare defiantly at her mother-in-law. In her own mind, she has won the contest for the possession of Marcel Monsin. You finish the point. Not everybody at once. It was. It was his wife. What happened to his mother? We let her go, of course. What happens to the Monsins? Comelior wants to see them as soon as possible. Together? Yes, to begin with. It is he who will make the announcement to the press. So if you will excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. And it's over. Personally, I'm going to bed. May Gray Sets a Trap by Frederick Sperling, with production and direction by Peter Duncan. 
Bud Knapp starred as the chief inspector. The other performers, John Bethune, Lynn Gorman, Nancy Kerr, Alan King, Corrine Langston, Arch McDonald, William Nunn, Frank Perry, and Drew Russell. Musical decor by Lucio Agostini. Sound effects, Bill Robinson. Larry Palos speaking. The program was recorded by Derek Stubbs.